Good morning, USM. Welcome to our first ever Professional Development Week. My name is Shivani Oyugoke, and I am your moderator for the session this morning. I am thrilled to have you all here today to kick off the USM Professional Development Week. The training committee made up of representatives in HR from across the system have been working for months putting together this week for you. So what is Professional Development Week, you ask? Well, this is about you, our employees, staff, and faculty. This is a week of knowledge building workshops designed to broaden and advance your skills for improved professional and personal well being. Because who doesn't want to feel good at work? Writer Annie Dillard once said, How we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. And for so many of us, a large portion of our days, our weeks, our months, and our years are spent in the workplace. The average person spends roughly 30% of their entire life at work. So with this in mind, our team of talent development professionals put together a week of workshops to take care of the whole employee. With workshop, with workshop titles such as Navigating Uncertainty with Grace and Ease, Cultivating Your Network, Servant Leadership, and keys to a high trust workplace. So wherever you are in your career, starting out with us or here for over 20 or more years, there is something for you. If you have not registered and created an account with Hopin, please do so today by going on our website and registering for the sessions on Tuesday through Thursday. Don't miss out on these exciting workshops tailored just for you. Your campuses have all pitched in to make this conference completely free to you. So be sure to let your HR staff know how much you appreciate them. Go ahead and send a quick thank you to your favorite HR representative. They can use all the positive emails they can get. The conference will run from Tuesday to Thursday on the Hopin platform and there will be opportunities for you to network with other USM employees throughout the week. It's kind of like speed dating with your fellow USM colleagues, both faculty and staff. Who knows who you'll meet? And so as we're putting together these incredible workshops, we knew we had to kick off this week with some very special guests. And so without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce the incredible panelists who took the time out of their busy schedules to join us for a discussion around reimagining the USM workplace in 2021 and beyond. Introducing our panelists from the University of Maryland School of Public Health, Professor and Dean Boris Lushniak. Welcome Dr. Lushniak. We are pleased to have you here with us today. Great, thank you for having me here. I'm really excited about being here and having this great discussion this morning. Great. From the University of Maryland, Baltimore, Roger Ward, Interim Provost, Executive Vice President, and Dean of the Graduate School. Welcome, Dr. Ward. They're sure keeping you busy at UMB. They try, they try. Good morning, it's a pleasure being here. From the University System of Maryland office, Z Senior Vice Chancellor for Academic and Student Affairs, Joanne Boffman. It's wonderful to have you here, Dr. Boffman. Great to see you. Thank you so much, Savani, and thank all of you from across the system for joining us this morning. Thanks. From the University of Maryland, President Daryl Pines. Welcome, President Pines. It's an honor to have you here. Good morning, Shivani, and good morning to all the participants from across the system, and thanks to everyone for putting on this workshop. And last, and certainly not least, our very own University System of Maryland Chancellor, Dr. Jay Perman. Thank you for joining us today, Chancellor. Thank you, Shivani. Uh, thank you to my esteemed colleagues on the panel uh, and special appreciation 
uh, to everyone on the HR Training Committee uh, for putting the week that you just heard about together. Uh, much appreciation, much appreciation to the HR teams across the system uh, for the support that you've provided throughout the pandemic. Uh, th this is such a vital topic that we're discussing today. Uh, I think in, in, in essence, what we're asking is what's the future of work? And a lot of what we're reading, all of us, focuses on things like the ascendancy of telework, maybe a workday that's more flexible, whose hours aren't the same as we typically set them. And those are all valid things to talk about. We should talk about them. Uh, you know, we probably haven't undertaken a broad restructuring of work in this country since we introduced the weekend. And that was a long time ago. Uh, but I want to kick things off by talking about what I've learned uh, about work since the pandemic began, what I've needed to be productive and engaged and as Giovanni said, happy at work. It's important that we be happy at work. Uh, and of course, what the system has needed to keep its mission front and center. Uh, there's a risk in this. You know, I can't pretend that I'm not the chancellor. So in my role, whatever I say, can sound like some sort of pronouncement. Please, please don't take it that way. Uh, I'm not issuing any edicts or making policy. That's for the institutions to do as well. My comments are personal. The first thing that, that struck me was how quickly, and this is paradoxical, our physical separation actually deepened collaboration and information sharing across institutions. I'll bet everyone on the panel can attest to that. It was as though in our isolation, we needed connection, we craved connection more than ever. Obviously we were dealing with unprecedented matters. So some of that is natural, but you know, we're nearly 16 months into the crisis, which we hope is abating. And while the number of meetings where we get together has trailed off somewhat, now that we have our bearings, I wouldn't be surprised if this new structure of cross institutional sharing which is exactly what this week is that you've organized. I'll bet that this sharing continues, which is all to the good. Uh, I think when we're surrounded by our own teams, we're more insular. Maybe we're a little less trusting of each other. We make our own decisions. And that autonomy is totally appropriate. The institutions are still making their own decisions. But what I see now is teams consulting with one another. I see presidents taking the pulse of universities close to them. For example, President Pines might check in with President Bro at Bowie State because they're neighbors. He's cited those examples over and over again. You know, neighbors check in with one another and ask if they're encountering similar issues and ask how they're handling them. Most of you know that I was a system president uh, for a decade before I came to the chancellorship. And, you know, I would attest that we've never had this kind of collaboration before across universities, across teams, 
across functional areas. It's different right now, and it feels different in a way uh, that will probably stick. But if my first revelation of the pandemic was that you don't need physical proximity for deep collaboration, and remember, this is personal. My second revelation is that I want the physical proximity anyway. Anyone who knows me, and I think it's true for these panelists who I know so well, uh, knows that I think out loud. I talk about issues with my team. I crave, I crave their ideas and their advice and their counsel to me. And yeah, you have the phone, you have Zoom, but boy, I still wanna be able to walk into a colleague's office and have the kind of meandering conversation that is far more easy to have in person. You know, the kind of discussion that doesn't have an agenda, but always seems to produce thoughtful outcomes. I don't want us to lose that. I know I personally don't want us to lose that. Let me sw flip the switch again though, and say that why, while I value the ability to talk face to face with coworkers, I'm more acutely aware than ever of the inequities that come into play. And this is something we need to keep on our minds. When some people work on site and some people work remotely. Those people on the phone, when all of you are gathered around in the office or the people on the Zoom call, when the rest of us are gathered in the office. The pandemic has made us more conscious, more mindful of issues of equity and access, equity and opportunity, uh, equity in being able to contribute to the organization's work and get recognized for it. So I'm teeing this up for you. If organizations continue some hybrid environment to whatever degree that's possible, these are the things that are gonna to need to be kept in mind. Uh, are we giving every employee the same work and advancement opportunities are we favoring employees we see over ones that we don't? Are we sharing praise equally? Are we giving everyone the same opportunities for professional development? Uh, I know my colleagues have thought about these and other issues. So like you, I'm eager to hear from them. Thank you. Chancellor Perman, as always, it is wonderful to hear you speak about and to our faculty and staff of this great system. And thank you for giving me such a great opening to my first question for our esteemed panel. This question on the topic of vision will go first to President Pines. President Pines, how do you envision the USM workplace in 2021 and beyond? Well, first of all, good morning again, Shivani. Thank you for having me. Um, good morning again to all the participants of this first ever USM Workplace 2021. And thank you to Namrata, Rithi from my institution, but to all the HR leaders across the system. So let me also say congratulations to everyone for making it through the past 16 months. <laughs> it's been a, quite a challenge, hasn't it? The past year has been filled with extraordinary challenges and opportunities. And the University of Maryland showed re resilience across all schools and fortitude in its continuing its mission to educate and, and conduct research at the highest level um, and to develop the workforce of the future. COVID-19 has had a significant impact on all of us, our students, our faculty, our staff, as well as parents and local businesses. Everyone has had to make adjustments as the chancellor just mentioned during this challenging time, but I'm proud of how all of us have developed new innovate, innovative ways to excel in our virtual environment. So going forward to kind of respond to your question in 2021, 
I believe um, there are many things that I could speak about, but I think there are four or five critical things that will happen going forward that will stay. Clearly, um, as uh, Dr. Luchnak spoke during the uh, intermission, uh, Zoom was not in our lexicon and it is now. So clearly that will be go uh, true going forward. But most importantly, as it relates to the workforce and the workplace, family care resources are now critical. Uh, we all struggle with the complexity of the pandemic and the complexity of sort of supporting all of our employees through their very intricate and delicate family life work balance. So we at College Park were fortunate. We uh, created a career, uh, career uh, caregiver workshop um, and organization and working group. And they actually came up with a process and a set of recommendations that we just implemented in the spring of 2021 to help all of our employees, including graduate students, so that's gonna stay with us, this new model of family care resources that really became more acute during the pandemic. Number two, uh, towards the issues of feeling included, um, as the chancellor mentioned, and having these equity issues, we are launching, as you have mentioned, a Terrapin Strong program um, in which we'll do an onboarding of all of our employees, all of our students, but towards our values, our traditions, our expectations, and to encourage them to respect one another going forward um, as part of our cultural values. Number three, another apparent issue that will go forward beyond 2021 and post COVID will be the expansion of mental health services for all of our employees, not just our students. And going in concert with that is an expansion of resources to those from our disabled community um, because they also suffered during the virtual time period of the pandemic. And then as we have lear all learned with Zoom, um, we were also innovative in our ability to deliver instructional services to our students. And we learned a lot with creativity and innovation in virtual learning, hybrid learning, um, and multi multiple modalities. And so that will go forward positively to help our students um, as we transition uh, beyond post COVID. So I'm excited about our collective future. It's been a hard year but I have optimism for the post-COVID world that we're gonna be working towards in the future. Thank you. Thank you, President Pines. I want to pass the same question on to Dr. Ward. Dr. Ward, what do you envision for the USM workplace? Thank you, Shavoni. And I, I echo good morning again, and I echo um, President Pines' um, recognition and congratulations of all of you who've been involved in pulling this together. And to all the participants, thank you for engaging. I, I believe that the post-pandemic workplace will obviously look much different than the pre-pandemic workplace. And I believe that teleworking in some form or fashion is here to stay and will look different than how it looked pre-pandemic. I also believe, however, that how teleworking gets deployed will vary from industry to industry, depending on the needs of the industry, and vary from even from organization to organization within certain industries. And because of that, I think as leaders, and um, Chancellor Perman touched on some of this, that there are challenges ahead of us as leaders of organizations as it relates to teleworking and what it might mean for our institutions and the institutions that we lead and the people that work and support the mission of those institutions. Um, for example, I think that as leaders, we haven't yet come to a meeting of the minds on exactly what the conceptual model is for what the future of work will look like. And I think we need intentional conversations about that. I think when we talk about teleworking, I don't, I'm not sure that we all share um, the same understanding of exactly what that means. And I, I think it, it behooves us as leaders of organizations to engage in those conversations. Um, President Pine just mentioned in concluding teaching and learning with technology and the transition that had to be made there. I think uh, we also have to train and educate our supervisors just as we had to, during the pandemic, um, train and educate our faculty in how to teach um, in an online environment or in a hybrid environment. 
I don't think we could assume that our supervisors um, would understand and know how to work in a hybrid environment, which is essentially uh, the environment that could potentially be created with telework, where you have some people working a significant amount of time in person and working a significant amount of time um, um, remotely as well. And you, you, the way one would lead in a fully in-person environment will be different from how one should lead in a hybrid environment. Again, Chancellor Pullman also touched on this. How do we evaluate employee productivity and performance? Uh, just as again, to use teaching as an example, just as you can use the same assignments when you're teaching online or in a hybrid format to evaluate students, you have to make adjustments to those assignments. I think we need to start rethinking how we evaluate employee productivity. And then I think we also need an earnest conversation around what we are seeking to optimize in this new working um, paradigm. Are we seeking to optimize employee satisfaction or employee productivity? And those two things don't have to be mutually exclusive, but they can be if we're not thoughtful about them. Or are we seeking to op optimize cost effectiveness? And then of course, my last point would be as, as leaders, how are we thinking about how this new working model could impact our norms and culture as an institution. Again, Chancellor Pullman talked about being able to walk into someone's office and have these meandering conversations. Those things contribute to our culture. And we as leaders need to think through the impact of this new working model on our culture. And we can't, otherwise uh, we, we run the risk um, of, of inadvertently fundamentally altering um, our institutions and not being thoughtful about it. Thank you, Dr. Ward and President Pines for your thoughtful answers. And your comments lead me to my next question on the topic of leadership. This question will go to President Pines first, then Dr. Boffman, and finally to you, Chancellor. President Pines, the question is, what are the leadership qualities you want to see in your colleagues across the system to thrive in the workplace? So I would say, um lots of qualities I've learned that are important during this time and important going forward. So let me just say one of the things that I think has been really important during the time period has been for leaders to have empathy and compassion for all of their employees and all of the stakeholders. I mean, the lifting of restrictions across the state of Maryland, along with the expectations for folks to return to work is causing some sense of anxiety across all classes of employees. We have instituted a number of intervention approaches to help employees transition back to work. These include virtual sessions to help answer any concerns that our employees have about return to in-person activities in the fall. So, so the big you know, issue there is just having that empathy and uh, understanding and compassion. Second, I wanna see my colleagues in terms of leadership continue to display the leadership qualities that took us to survive the pandemic. And that was critical thinking, creativity, and innovation. During the height of the pandemic, I saw incredible partnerships as Chancellor Herman alluded to, more than it's ever been between institutions and the system. I wanna see those collaborations continue across academic affairs, student affairs, operations, information technology, healthcare. There were so many incredible partnerships that were born because of the pandemic and they should go forward in terms of leadership helping us all, keep us all safe. Uh, we, kept, we created COVID-19 um, transparent websites for testing, for vaccinations now, and that's been a really good thing. So I've engaged several colleagues uh, and leaders in Maryland to pursue fearless ideas as well, both in this moment and also once the coronavirus is conquered. And now I want to charge all of you, all of you are on in this workshop to do the same. We must move beyond this situation that we're in and start believing in the future of our institutions going forward in the entire state of Maryland and the nation and for that matter the world and so what would I like to encourage everyone to be critical thinkers creative innovative and fearless thank you thank you Dr. Pines Dr. Boffman what are the leadership qualities you would like to see 
among your colleagues across the system? Well, I'm going to actually overlap with a few things that Dr. Pine said, um, but I'm going to hit on three areas pretty quickly, if that's all right, Shivani. The first one is awareness, and that is both self-awareness and true awareness of others, which could be a termed empathy. Uh, leaders would recognize the challenges and the limits that we are in, but then can help folks move beyond those limits with both optimism and energy. And I think all of us are starting to feel some more of that optimism as we make this turn. We need to recognize the gaps in our own skills and in those around us, understand our experience, work to fill them, reminding ourselves that as each of us lifts up ourself, we lift up everybody along with us. This week is all about uh, professional development and learning about recognizing those strengths and understanding some of those challenges, but gaining new insights on how to move beyond them. The second piece I'd like to mention quickly is push and pull. Now, most people think of leaders as always out in front, um, recognizing the future possibly earlier than some others, showing what can be and showing everybody how to get there. So that would be pulling people along. But I would remind us that we can all be pushed uh, as well. We can facilitate collective action. Some have mentioned this to be leading from behind, if you will. Don't necessarily think it's behind, but moving the entire group forward. It can be general guidance sometimes. Sometimes it can be pretty harsh, but we always hope with integrity and honesty that we lead those. But uh, I would in fact urge folks to engage in both pushing and pulling of themselves and those around them, no matter how small the unit or large the organization. And the third comment that I would like to make is um, great leaders all have gratitude. And I think you've heard several thank yous this morning already, but I think this week is also about gratitude for everything that people have put in during this last year and how we can put that together and make ourselves and the USM, our individual units and institutions even better. Thank you so much, Dr. Bosman. Chancellor, I look forward to hearing about the leadership qualities you want to see in order for a thriving workplace environment. Well, as uh, usual, President Pines and Senior Vice Chancellor Boffman have been uh, their eloquent and thoughtful selves. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I heard words like empathy, compassion, awareness. These are very uh, inspiring and challenging words. And what I'd like to do with my few minutes uh, is challenge all of you who are needed to be leaders to pay attention to a particular skill that's within all of you, but it's a skill that we all need to hone. And I'm going to come back to this perhaps as we go through the balance of the time. That skill is listening. Listening. I better make a definition here of listening. Uh, you know, listening is defined as the ability to accurately receive and interpret messages in the communication process. So that's a very active process. You've got to put energy into it if you're going to listen. And uh, if you don't mind, I'm actually going to draw on some lessons about listening from my other profession, my, my medical profession. Uh, some of you perhaps heard of Sir William Osler. He was one of the founding physicians of the Johns Hopkins Hospital and Medical School. And he said in the early 1900s, if you listen closely enough, the patient will tell you his diagnosis. How about that? If you take the proper history, if you've listened, 
it's a piece of cake most of the time. Maybe Dr. Lushniak doesn't agree with me entirely. But the patient will tell you his diagnosis. And in all these years, I've learned that again and again. And here's some inside baseball talk. You know, the Mayo Clinic has studied how long it takes for a physician to start listening, taking a history before they interrupt you, before they don't allow you to get the whole story out. I'm disappointed to tell you all that it's less than 20 seconds on average in a primary practice before you're interrupted. Don't do that. Listen. If you want to lead, listen. And by the way, listening doesn't mean agreeing. You know, I can't stand it. I got to tell everybody when I've listened and then somebody says later, you didn't listen to me. Listening has got nothing to do with necessarily agreeing, but you've got to put the investment into listening. That's the mark of a leader. I can guarantee you it will take you far in, especially in these times, in moving us forward and in your leading. Thank you. Wow. Thank you all for your thorough answers. This next question is around the topic of mastery and gets a little bit more personal. Dr. Ward, we'd love to hear from you first. Can you tell us about a time you experienced great upheaval and what aspects of personal mastery you needed? Thank you for that question, Shivani. Um, it would be very appropriate and in fact, easy for me in terms of thinking about um, a time where I experienced great upheaval to just cite the, to, to what we are living in now, which is the COVID-19 pandemic, um, because it has been one of the greatest, if not the greatest ex upheaval that any of us um, would have, ex have experienced. However, for me personally, and you said this, this is more personal, the, more, more than COVID-19, the murder of Mr. George Floyd was even more of an upheaval um, for me um, than the COVID-19 pandemic. Why? Well, because his death and the circumstances around his killing laid bare for the world to see the disparate treatment of black males and females for that matter in this country at the hands of some police officers. In addition, and I would say perhaps even more importantly, it forced many in leadership, including myself in this country to reckon with the reality that is systemic racism, a topic, a conversation that as a country we have neglected for far too long, I would say. Um, it was an upheaval because it wasn't isolated to one aspect of my identity. I had to deal with that upheaval as a black male. I had to deal with it as a father. And of course, I had to deal with it as a university leader. And of course, each of these identities, that black male identity, that <clears throat> father identity, that university identity, each has a different set of expectations and responsibilities and, and a different role associated with each one. In terms of how I dealt with that upheaval and continue to deal with it, um, it required me to master, it's interesting, this perhaps is, is because I've spent way too much time over the last 10 years working with, with, with now Chancellor Perman when he was president at UMB. But actually one of the, the, the things I needed to master and get better at was the art of listening. Because obviously, you know, the death of Mr. George Floyd spurred a whole lot of conversation, an acrimonious conversation at that. People on all ends of the political spectrum had a point of view. 
And in order to engage respectfully and earnestly, you had to listen to what was being said and you had to listen with empathy. So I also had to master the art of understanding whether or not I agreed with people's perspective, their political ideology, where they were coming from. I had to listen with empathy and be empathetic. I also had to be, of course, earnest in my own communication and communicating transparently what I was feeling and how I felt about that as a leader. Um, so, the, so mastering um, the art of communication. And again, not just communicating, but communicating earnestly and transparently. And I had to, to also master being honest about how I was feeling, um, about my anger about around this issue, um, my disappointment, my frustrations, and just being honest in conversations with my family and with the team that I was leading um, so that we could all have these earnest conversations and then figure out how we move forward um, to make this world a better place. You know, our mission here at UMB is to improve the human condition. And how do we do that? Um, have these hard, difficult, trying conversations in an earnest, honest way, and then help try to, to move us closer towards that mission. Thank you so much, Dr. Ward. Um, you will transition us into our next question, but before we do that, Dr. Lushniak, I look forward to hearing from you about a time of upheaval and what aspects of personal mastery you needed. Well, well thank you. And, and again, also thank you for having me here today. Uh, you know, as I was thinking through, right, this whole concept, I, I want to remind the audience, right, the term personal mastery is not something that just sort of, you know, uh, is, is part of our daily lexicon. So let's, let's first emphasize that component. And, and it sounds really highfalutin, right? personal mastery. And what does it really mean? You know, it talks about the concepts of what? Of living and working purposefully towards a vision. So there's a vision component of personal mastery. And this is at a personal level. It's in essence having that vision that allow, aligns itself with what? With the values, right? That you possess as an individual. And the fact that guess what? Even amongst all these leaders here today, right? I think you know, we'll disagree about certain things, we'll agree about it, but we will 100% agree with the concept of what? That we are constantly learning in the process of leadership, right? One is never a master of leadership. One is constantly readjusting. And, and, and you know, I've done a lot of speaking on the, you know, the concept of leadership, and people are sometimes amazed that, in essence, is it's a reflection of the concepts of personal mastery and that we've been through various upheavals. We learn from each and every one and re, uh, re readjust with time. And, and when I thought about, you know, the examples that I've had, you know, those of you who know me know I spent 27 years wearing a uniform of the uniform service of our nation, the U.S. Public Health Service. That was my public health practice component of my life. And I look back at the upheavals in public health in this century alone, and the ones that I personally experienced from a leadership perspective, right? There's the World Trade Center in Ground Zero in New York, right? Thrust into that environment, the chaos and the destruction and the sadness of how that our world was changed as a result of that. That then dovetailed into the anthrax attacks, right? And being a, a member of that team here in Washington, D.C. You throw in Hurricane Katrina and the hurricanes, the idea of us feeling vulnerable from natural disasters. You throw in the 2009 pandemic of H1N1 that woke us up that we don't, we are not masters of infectious diseases from a public health aspect. And then also, uh, Ebola, having been a responder and spent time in Liberia in the midst of all that, I reflect on this personal mastery in the midst of that per, uh, upheaval. And the first component I think is critical to everybody, right? And as Roger sort of just meant, you know, mentioned, we throw in the COVID experience and depending on the terminology you use, Dr. Pines, you know, talks about, you know, the multiple grand challenges. I use the term the syndemics. There's so much that went on in this last year and a half racism, violence, political upheaval, right? We throw in the climate change aspect. We throw in the idea that we are dealing with the worst pandemic of our lifetimes and multi-generational lifetimes. We have to go back a hundred years to experience something like that. 
And the first aspect of personal mastery in all these scenarios, the common thread initially from a leadership perspective, but I beseech all our listeners to look at this. Number one is my first reaction to things ultimately are in those first 15 to 20 seconds is, oh my God, I don't think I can handle this. It's fear. It's saying I've been hit with things before and I don't think I can do this. I got to admit, people sometimes are surprised. You, you know, you've had all this experience. You're fearful. It doesn't last long. It doesn't paralyze me from action, but it makes me reflect, which is, okay, take a deep breath. Get yourself into a mood of what is the vision? What is the direction? What is the mission? And how are we going to get there? Second aspect of this is take care of yourself in this personal mastery, right? You can't just get in 100% and say, I'm all dedicated to the mission. It doesn't work unless you're taking care of yourself and your loved ones and your teammates. So when I look at personal, you know, sort of the, the upheavals of society in, 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 you know, from a public health angle and other things, personal mastery begins here at home, right? It, it, it's often tied in with the other term called self-leadership. Right. And the concept is get your act together, take a deep breath and start focusing. But don't forget about two aspects. And one that was mentioned by, by Chancellor Furman, don't forget that you have to listen. You can't just talk. And ultimately, you have to take a deep breath every so often and cleanse yourself. Cleanse the mind, relax and take care of the loved ones around you in the midst of all that. That's personal mastery from my perspective. Thank you so much. Oh, these, and wow, wow. I am so happy that we're having these conversations. So happy. I hope these answers are as inspiring to our audience as they are to me. The next question I have is near and dear to my heart and Dr. Ward, you kind of keyed us up to this, um, but on May 27th, in a statement on hate speech, violence, and bigotry, Chancellor Perman reminded us, and I quote, the USM is committed to securing equity for all members of our communities, demanding justice on their behalf and defending the principles on which this country was founded and which it struggles still to honor. This question around diversity, equity, and inclusion, inclusion is for Dr. Boffman first, then President Pines, and finally Chancellor Perman. President Pines, the USM workforce is diverse. When it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, what is your vision for the USM and how do we develop employees in order to achieve it? Shivani, did you want that for Dr. Pines or me first? Um, I'm sorry, Dr. Boffman, please go ahead first, sorry. Thank you. Um, I looked up uh, one, of the, one of the terminologies here and uh, the definition talked about explicit and sustained engagement with equity. And as Shivani said, and as the chancellor has clearly articulated, the USM and your own institutions deeply believe in these terms and are working toward that. We can point to some diversity things. Seven of our 12 presidents in the USM are African-American. I would point out only three of 12 are women. So we have some work to do, ladies and gentlemen. But I want to remind us that we have come a long way. Uh, over 30 years ago, when I became a tenured full professor at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, there were about 1,000 faculty. And I was the seventh female to, in fact, reach that. So we have come a long way. We all want to achieve this, but I'm going to bring it back to the personal level, if, if I can, please. Um, and that is awareness and true honesty on the part of each one of us. And I really don't have answers, but I'm going to ask uh, the group some questions that you could ask yourself. I ask myself these questions frequently. What are your assumptions and expectations are of others every day and in every way? Do you expect appropriate, if not exactly the same outcomes from various people? If there has been differential access to opportunity, 
What are you doing about that today in an interaction or a challenge that you give somebody? Are you always on the lookout for barriers or unrealistic expectations? For example, in student expectations or in a hiring process, have you truly accounted for grit and the overcoming of differential barriers and given people appropriate credit for having achieved what they have achieved? You know those, those tactics and those uh, attributes will serve those folks well in the future. Include them in your assessments as you go through these processes. And lastly, I would ask, are you truly being inclusive and welcoming to those who don't look just like you? In every situation, whether it's a formal meeting or whether it's one of those spontaneous conversations or meandering conversations that the chancellor talked about, are you truly being inclusive rather than exclusive as you have those spontaneous uh, interactions because many new and important decisions are made based on those conversations. So I come back to thinking about this and being aware of it every day and in every way. Thank you so much, Dr. Bossman. President Pines. Uh, thank you, Shivani. Um, and so uh, this issue is very near and, and personal to me. Um, when I became president uh, on July 1st last year, I basically said to our community, based on the incredible year that 2020 was, the syndemics, the multiple pandemics that Dr. Lucianak refers to, one of them was related to the unfortunate passing of George Floyd. Um, but it's an opportunity of us to be, reflect and look at ourselves. So I said I had two priorities. Number one was to be an excellent in everything that we do. And number two was to create a more multicultural inclusive community, which really hits towards the diversity, equity and inclusion issue. And then with that, I launched 12 initiatives across the campus because I believe as a leader, you can't just talk about DEI and not be intentional in what you really believe and what you think your community needs to move to a better plateau, which is why I launched those 12 initiatives. And one of them was this onboarding program uh, I call it Terrapin Strong, which is basically that from the moment you arrive at the University of Maryland College Park, that you would be indoctrinated into our culture, our values, our traditions, and what it means to respect one another and how we can help every citizen, every stakeholder reach their full potential. And that's what that program is all about. And it's gonna roll out 100% across the campus for everyone this fall. And that will be done every year. And it's really to really Start it from the ground level, number one. So be intentional. Number two, during my investiture, which I was so grateful that uh, Chair Linda Gooden of the Board of Regents and Chancellor Perman were there to um, launch me off on my launch pad. And at that investiture to move Maryland, University of Maryland forward, I also made some announcements that were intentional on purpose along faculty diversity for tenured faculty across this campus. Because again, I think it's important to cultivate and embrace your values and to execute them and to be delivered about them. So to me, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion are very simple. I really believe it in terms of a math equation. I always tell this when I tell the story, which I believe it's this simple. Diversity plus excellence equals success plus innovation. That's simple. And if we just look at it that, through that lens, which I've looked at it through that lens my entire life, 26 years of being at this campus, but doing so many projects that involve diverse teams from across the university, it has always led to something innovative and excellent going forward. So I believe that's really how we kind of should look at it. And if we look at it through that lens, then we can see that people bring all kinds of strengths to our problems and we can come up with all kinds of creative solutions because we involve everyone. And so it's important for diversity, equity, and inclusion to be intentional about what you mean about it and also how you execute it. And you know, just as another thing, you know, as another example, we just um, open up uh, to the sports community um, another signature facility on this campus that we gave an honorific naming to, and it was to commemorate 
the University of Maryland's impact on college athletics to break the color barrier, both the color barrier in basketball and football in the Atlantic Coast Conference. And we named the facility after the two trailblazers that broke those color barriers, right? Their names were Dr. Mr. Darrell Hill, the first to um, play football in the ACC and at the University of Maryland, and Mr. Billy Jones, who was the first to play basketball. I believe that this is primarily symbolic, but it also acknowledges our history and our values for breaking the color barrier and making athletics more inclusive for all as well. So we mean it across every enterprise at our institution. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Chancellor Perman. At the risk of uh, perseverating, I'm coming back to listening as it relates to this subject, this important subject as well. And you can already anticipate what I'm getting at. And I'm going to come back again to that medical metaphor analogy. Uh, remember what I told you about Sir William Osler, uh, the importance of getting the whole history or you're not gonna get it. You're not gonna understand. Uh, I uh, had the privilege when I was getting ready to be a medical school dean some years ago of having a mentor uh, and my mentor was the longtime dean of the University of Colorado School of Medicine, uh, Dick Krugman. Here's the first lesson he told me. He said, if you don't understand a person's behavior, you don't have enough history. He was using that business of making sure you get the whole history. So I was sitting here listening to my longtime colleague, Dr. Ward. And look at what he told us. He told, about, he told us about the pain he had, the anger he had, the challenge of doing his job while he was managing all of that over this past year. So I listened and I understand some of the things that I actually wondered about this year, because I'm so close to Dr. Ward. If we're gonna move the needle on diversity, equity, and inclusion, we're gonna to have to be better listeners. And I know that some of those conversations are very uncomfortable. They don't fit with your constructs all the time. When somebody says something to you about institutional racism, for example, and you're a leader in that institution, for God's sakes, she's saying that I'm a racist. Those are uncomfortable conversations, but you gotta be able to listen and you need to listen with energy until they finish giving you the history. Chancellor Perman, President Pines, and Dr. Boffman, thank you so much for tackling that question. And I look forward to seeing how the USM continues to grow and develop in its DEI efforts. Um, this next question is another more personal one around the topic of wellness. And starting with you, Dr. Lushniak, as a leader of a complex organization, you too have had to balance work and home life throughout this pandemic. Could you share with us an example in, in a minute, just to be cautious of time, from your own life and best practice solution for sustaining this balance? Yeah, sort of on the personal level. I mean, you know, let's go back to last March and we all remember it well, right? At College Park, what do we do is we all went home for spring break, in essence, never to return. And, and, and that was not disruption for our College Park community. That was a familial disruption, right? Because all of a sudden, my wife, who's working from home, she's a physician, but is in the chart review world, she's always there at her computer, now has company, and that's me. And then we have two college-age daughters, right, who also were brought in from their institutions back. And then the reality is that that disruption within the family, you know, 
there had to be sort of a positive spin on things, right? We're all scared about the pandemic. We're all scared about the syndemics, the, the murder of George Floyd, everything is disturbing. And yet what? The ability for us to focus on this is the time and place we did not choose for this to happen, but what are we going to do about it? And the unity of the family at that point, right? The ability for us to say, you know, we were empty nesters until the two kids came home. Well, I'm now somewhat blessed in the midst of this incredibly disruptive scenario with what? I have unexpected time with my kids. And from a personal wellness aspect, it was realizing what's the positive of this. It was, again, when I talk about health, it's about the World Health Organization definition of health. Complete. Complete is key as an adjective. Complete what? Complete physical, mental, and social well-being. And so we, in essence, emphasize that. The daily walks into the woods near our homes, even in the midst of the pandemic, wearing the masks and to see what? To see the family of eagles that has a nest at the lake nearby return yet again, to see the babies born, and this past week, to see them learn to fly again, right? That's a sense of us having stability in the midst of instability. And I think that's a key feature. Find out people of the world out there listening to us, right? 636 of you, what has worked for you? What were the lessons learned in this last year and a half when it came to health and wellness? And continue on that front. This is something we have to learn from. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lushniak. So one thing that we, learned very quickly, and you, you touched on it, is that for the pandemic, home life and responsibilities were different for many employees. Some employees wrestled with children, both school-aged and young adults, others with aging parents, some with neighbors, their, their community, some with pets. So Dr. Boffman, now to you. When it comes to work-life balance this past year or throughout your career, could you share with us an example and best practice solution? Um, I'm going to be a, a little bit different here, although I really appreciate Dr. Lushniak's uh, comments there. I think they were right on target. Um, I think we need to figure out the difference between needs and wants. And I think that this last year has really put some of that into perspective so that each of us can really assess our lives and those things that we need most. Um, and I'm going to give a very different kind of example. I suffer from migraine headaches. And I knew this last year was gonna be a real challenge for me uh, and so on. Um, and I'm not always very good at this one. I will push and push into a migraine, but I've surrounded myself. I've been smart enough to surround myself with people who recognize uh, the, an oncoming migraine in me before I do. And I have been able to say, I need your help in assessing this so I can avoid it. What that does is brings me back to, uh, I think, the fact that you aren't any good for anybody else unless you're good for yourself. And for those of you who've flown on airplanes, I think this is a, a lesson for life. They say, put your own oxygen mask on first and then help others with theirs. I think that's a, a, a story that all of us can live by you have to take care of you so that you can take care of others. Thank you so much, Dr. Bossman. You have been closely looking at our schedule for this week because that's absolutely one of um, the sessions that are going on. So I'm hoping that everyone in the audience is getting something out of this. I know I sure am. Um, my final question is for President Pines followed by final comments from Chancellor Perman. And this question is about values. President Pines, what have been the biggest challenges and opportunities as it relates to upholding your most deeply ingrained values during these tough times? Uh, thank you, Shivani. I'm, I'm sort of answer this question a little bit differently and look towards the future. So, you know, where there's always crisis, there's always opportunity. Uncertain times like we have been in require us to be bold. This is our time to reinvent or reimagine our USM and our universities. This is a time to examine the future of learning, to enhance the student experience, the future of work for faculty and staff, to reach a new level of excellence, 
and a new model of research to accelerate and advance science and human understanding. We are embarking on a journey to reimagine our university together as we begin at College Park, our strategic planning exercise which started about a couple of weeks ago. This is time to think strategically, to discover and implement 21st century ways to improve the quality of instruction again, research, administrative operations, and the spirit of community. This is a time to vigorously promote research and scholarship and to enhance the student experience and our work environment in significant ways that we've never done before. So I look forward to engaging our entire campus community around these shared goals to reimagine our campus and community as a modern flagship research university in the third decade of the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you, President Pines. And Chancellor Perman, I'm turning it over to you for your final comments. And as you've led the system over the past 15 months through an unprecedented crisis, what's been one of your biggest challenges? Well, uh... I've talked about the separation, uh, which is so unnatural for all of us. <laughs> Human beings just don't stay six feet apart. I mean, that's not us. And uh, as has been talked about today, and as I know all of you have experienced, uh, this physical distancing uh, has been an extraordinary challenge uh, for me. Uh, it's just not my nature. It's just not human nature. Uh, and uh, I'm glad that uh, uh, God willing and uh, uh, science willing, uh, we are going to be able to close in on each other again uh, and engage with each other. Uh, I want to highlight uh, what others have said and what I know you will focus on later in the week. Uh, you all need to take care of yourselves. You all need to take care of your families. Otherwise, nothing good is going to happen uh, for the benefit of the institutions uh, and the system. You need to be mindful of your time. Uh, you talked about work-life balance. You need, to be, you need to be mindful about ways to keep up your energy and your health. Uh, and take care of uh, restoring yourselves periodically uh, so that you can, as Giovanni said at the outset, be happy, uh, be happy at work. Values, there are so many important values and each of our institutions has a value statement. Uh, the system has a set of values. Uh, I talked about listening. When you really listen to somebody, you know what you're doing to them? You're being nice to them. And uh, I don't care what you call it, mutual respect, civility. Nice is an important value. Uh, we'll solve a lot of these problems if during these difficult times and the times ahead of us that are going to be difficult, uh, we pay attention to being nice to each other. Uh, I don't care how uh, mushy that four letter word is, we need to be nice to each other. Uh, you all are an inspiration to me and my colleague leaders here uh, every day. Uh, I really mean that. Uh, I thank Namrata for her significant organizational skills in putting this together. Of course, Shivani, our moderator, and all of you. Uh, Thank you for being a family. Thank you, Chancellor Perman. President Pines, Dr. Boffman, Dr. Ward, and Dr. Lushniak, thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate you taking the time to talk to us this morning about reimagining the USM workplace in 2021 and beyond. And for my audience, over 800 of you out there, I don't know about you all, but my cup is full. And I really appreciate that you've joined this discussion this morning. Thank you for your attention. I hope you found this as beneficial as I did 
and are able to take some of this information, all of these nuggets that we got this morning that was shared today and apply it to both your personal and professional life. Um, just for a few moments, if you can just hang on, I do want to take a quick moment to thank some specific people for putting this panel together and the USM Professional Development Week together. Um, I first want to start out um, by thanking the USM Training Committee. This conference would not be possible without them. And I've met with them weekly for the, with this work group. They are dedicated individuals and we've been working at this for months now. Their enthusiasm and service continue to inspire me. I want to thank Namrata Ramandresens from UMD for functioning as the program manager and Maciel Leach from UNGC for working as our project manager. I wanna thank Zandra Rawlings from UB for being an active vocal and dedicated committee member who kept us on task and honest. I also want to thank Mark Emmel from UMB and Heather Killeen from FSU for coordinating all of the incredible workshops you will attend this week and preparing all of our facilitators for their sessions. I also want to thank Jill Rice from TU who will be hosting our next session this afternoon. We're so excited and we're really appreciative of all the talents and the expertise you all are bringing. Jill Wardell from UMBC and Wendy Ringling from SU for managing engagement and networking events. Please be sure to network with your colleagues at USM. A big thank you to Michelle Hunt from UMB and Jesse Knapper from USMO for coordinating the surveys you will all be invited to participate throughout the week. They will let us know what you loved, what you didn't, and how much you want us to do this again next year, right? Big thanks to USMO's very own Nina Narayanan, who always stepped in and stepped up when asked. Nina is the producer for this session, and I hope you will agree that it was an impactful session. And of course, I must thank the following contributors for this conference, Rachel Dodonna from UMD, who got us all on hopping and patiently, I must emphasize patiently, walked us all through the process. Rachel, you are our hopping rock star. And I also want to thank USM's office own Marcus Harrington for creating the web page, um, which I'm going to ask you all to go on to to register, usmd.edu, that's our website, and completing all of the updates. Um, lastly, thank you to Chris Fukui from UMD, who was responsible for conference communications and brand management. I also want to say thank you to Fred Hayes, the USMO's Director of IT Operations, who was voluntold into his position as our Zoom tech and host. We're so happy to have him here. Thanks, Fred, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. And finally, to our audience, I really hope you enjoyed the panel, whether you're listening while working or watching avidly. You, our staff and faculty, fulfill the mission of USM every single day you show up to work. This professional development week is for you. So please take the time to attend as many as the, of the workshops over the coming week as you can. And also be sure to register for our Friday Reflect Back sessions where you can share what you've learned and network with your colleagues across the system. If you haven't yet, again, go visit our website on this slide and take the time to register on the Hopin website shown here. Registration is quick and easy and free. Please make sure when you're registering to select the campus you work for, there may or may not be a friendly competition among our talent development professionals. So make sure your register, registration counts. Happy Professional Development Week, USM. Stay healthy, stay well, and remain engaged. Thank you. <laughs>